Nice. Thank you. So the Sarabande, among the, all of the sort of normal dances in the suites, was most... Uh, um, there are double, and those are just variations. And so making variations on the Sarabande at the keyboard was a big tradition. And I think that this is a great improvisation model to, to use and to, to just feel the basic steps first so that whatever you do, you're, you're expressing that, right? And then we can make other, other variations. So it would be really great if somebody wanted to take the Sarabande they're working on, and even if it has a double for tomorrow, make a new variation and share it with us. I was playing around with it myself the other day, and one thing you can do that's really easy is to just um, give yourself the job of inverting books to uh broken chord patterns. Just that's a nice exercise to do. To just play in the double, everything that goes down, play it up, and everything that goes up, play it down. Everything that goes nowhere, go nowhere in another direction. Let's see what what uh, results you get. So we have another. Just one more version before we go on. Good. Let's keep that idea and do it one more time. And, and you know, for the big beats, yeah. um, the, I think the more effective in the, the, the Saraband is to is to have quite a short. I think we'll find it in books of his ornamentation. There's quite a short and powerful ornament mm -hmm. to actually signal the, the big beat. So if you start filling in too much, the the power of the boom, the second beat goes away. So it's, with that in mind, just try. Basically what you just did one more time. Beautiful guys, thank you. Nice. All right, so on the last page, you have a short Sarabande by Dupas, and, and let's use our new notation. First, uh, you notice uh, on the previous page, uh, Natalie Little et al. I think this is it's quite a nice thing to keep in mind. We usually think about one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. But a dancer thinks one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It, 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 it focuses on the fact that we're playing a sentence that's danced. So, first of all, why don't you write over the big beats on the last page uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So, just, just write numbers for yourself so that you have. And then a new set of 1 through 12 for the second four bars. And so what they recommend, I mean, first, it, it's, uh, we have a pattern, a rhythmical pattern that is singular to B that we perform together. No, it's not B. It's A. It's, it's A three times in a row. And so we have to have, so it's, it's pom, pa, pom, pa, pom, pa, pom, pa, pom, pa, pa, and then again, a third time. So what we need to do is figure out how to map out a little bit of variation for ourselves. And it's basically, I think, what Stefan and, and Shinon just came to, 
We think about the first bar is arsic with a little a, and then the whole second bar is thetic, so you could write a t in a long arrow. And then the, new, the next pair is a little a, and the bar four is all thetic. And then bar five is the climax, so you can write a, a capital A for bar five. And then everything else is thetic. Shinon already was doing a really nice job of this, but we need to use ornaments in different ways, depending on whether they're active or, or passive movements. So if you draw a circle around the, the trill in bar two to remind yourself to play it as, as, as softly or as quietly as possible, if you can think about the glissé movement, think about moving the fingers without leaping, that might be a nice image to use. And so in, in every pair, there's an ornament for the note you're trying to accent. And then at the beginning of the next bar, where we're used to playing a strong beat, we have to play the quietest possible uh, trill. And in bar one, two, three, four, five, six, do you know what that ornament is with a, the parentheses on either side of the note? You start below the note, and then you play a mordant. And also there's a fun French ornamentation thing in the first bar. That long parenthesis means that you get to roll the chord from down to up. And that's also what the slashing thing means in the third bar as well. Although if it's in a small interval, it can also mean you can fill in. I think you can probably also fill in there if you want to. So if, there's a, if you see a slashy thing in the, the third, it means that you can play a color note in between. All right, let's try hearing a couple of performances of this. Let's do it as duets. Let's go on doing that. Um, that's so cool. Yes. Do you want to be the soprano? Okay. And who else who wants to play the bass line? Then, great. Another thing that Meredith recommends that in this four, five, six, so it, after the, the climax, there's a descending line of eighth notes. And there we can really play notes in Egal if we want to. So long, short, long, short, long, short, in this pattern of transitus that we practiced yesterday. So here, that one. play in paired finger, strong, weak, you will automatically get really nice. Nice, good. Um, uh, why don't you both use both hands? Because then the ornamentation gets much easier. So you can you can play. And and that one can do the same thing.
could be sharper, couldn't it? Can we get them to be sh sharper with rhythm? So if we make a gesture. Oh, as if you're really leaping in the air. So you're coming from a step. If you can think about moving to another foot there. Can we also try the, this? Um, often the accented beat has to do with harmony too, right? On beat two and bar one, what do you see in the bass line? Is it a consonance or a dissonance? It's a real dissonance, isn't it? So if you can, if you can even play a little route, yeah. I know this is like dancing, right? I mean, <laughs> you have to coordinate. Your movement, but if you can think, boom, They have a flute clock that needs to be restored, and that's what we're doing. Have you, do you know what a flute clock is? There are two reasons to bring up flute clocks at this point. In, in France at this time, they, they programmed barrels to play melodies as much like human beings as possible. And one of the ways they did that, uh, the barrel looks like this, right? That's supposed to be a circle. So this is, this is the barrel. <laughs> and and the, the organ inside has a set of keys that just have a little metal thingy that sticks down. And before you finish putting the pins in the barrel, you first make a piece of paper where you're going to program your piece. It has lines like this. And then between lines one and two, you make like a, a, a bracket out of brass. So the brass bracket goes like this. And you hammer that into the barrel. And when that comes around, the key lifts up and it, it lets air into a pipe. So uh, at this, exactly when, when uh, this music was written, they were learning that it sounds more like human beings playing if the, if, uh, a strong note in a pair of two notes takes up three-fifths of the space and the weak note takes up two-fifths of the space, including the, the, the articulation. So in, in two eighth notes, they could program da 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 so that it sounded actually like people playing in a gun. The other thing that the flute clocks um, question, and this is a really big question, is whether rubato happens ever at the end of a, a movement in the same way that we, we automatically do it when we play romantic music. So the, the, the dance pieces and the, the variations go right up to the end without any, any rubato, and they could have programmed it if they'd wanted it. So let's try, um, when you get to, to, to the end, um, just go on and don't leave the, the energy behind, because frankly, it's a lot easier for the dancers, isn't it? So here we not, not only have the flute clocks to think about, but the, 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 the dancers also make a good argument for playing <clears throat> expressively as heck within the bar, but not slowing down at the end of the phrase. So let's try one once again. Mm -hmm. 